You were talking about um, the education that you received at your, uh, your elementary school. So I noticed that education and discipline go hand in hand, especially with young children, because I'm a father of fairly young children. So I wanted to know, as a psychologist, in your estimation, how important is discipline in developing the psyche of black children, in particular black boys? It's critical uh, because discipline is divine. God is discipline. Mm -hmm. The sun rises at a certain time on a schedule. Right. The moon rises at a certain time on a schedule. You know, you get your four seasons of the year on schedule. You know, you get your, your eclipses on schedule. Mm -hmm. The entire universe is ran on a divine schedule. And so we as African people, in order for us to manifest our divinity, we have to also manifest discipline. And I consider discipline to be one of the most important jobs of a black parent, because if your child doesn't have discipline, it doesn't matter how much talent they have. It doesn't matter how much skill they have. It doesn't matter how intelligent they are. When I speak at, you know, graduations like I did yesterday in Rochester, I always tell the young people, I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how talented you are. It means nothing unless you have the discipline to perfect that skill, right. you understand? So, you know, and it's critical that you bring this topic up because that's a big problem in our community because we have so many of our black boys being raised by single moms. Right, right. And that's not the mother's fault. It's due to the war on black men. Right. And a mother is not a natural disciplinarian. She's a nurturer. Mm -hmm. So she's more likely to negotiate as opposed to set standard. Mm -hmm. That's the father's job. But because of the absence of the father from the home, that's giving birth to this situation where black boys are not going to school or into the world with the discipline that they need. Mm -hmm. Not because of the failure of the mother, but because of the failure of black men, mm -hmm. those of us who are available, not putting some structure to the raising of black boys who don't have their fathers at home, you see. So I don't fault the, the women, I fault the men. And so that's given rise to a situation where the schools are targeting black boys for the ADHD, the conduct disorder, the ODD, the learning disabilities, the emotional uh, disturbances. Even though it's illegal to put children in special ed for behavior, it's supposed to be learning. They're using it as a trash can where they dump black boys who don't know how to control themselves. Right. Even though it's illegal, they're doing it. Right. And so we have to do better with the discipline in our community or we're gonna lose another generation of black males. Very good information. And uh, one thing about the discipline you touched on it is in the single parent household, especially when the mother is the primary guardian, a lot of times that discipline can be compromised. Yes. Which leads me to this question. Um, there are a lot of parents, a lot of black parents who aren't together. And for those who are not together and who don't get along, mm -hmm. how do they keep the children's best interests, including discipline, at heart when the situation is like that? I'm going to go back to discipline again because the children's priority should take precedence over whatever relationship conflicts the two parents have. Right. So with that being said, the children should never know why y'all broke up. Right. The children should not know y'all don't get along. They should see none of that. Mm -hmm. So you got to have emotional discipline. You have to keep your children's best interests at heart because one of the quickest ways to destroy self-esteem of a child. And if you look at children who have low self-esteem, one of the biggest causes of that low self-esteem after parental criticism is parental conflict between one another. Mm -hmm. See, when the father talks about the mother, you're still hurting the child. When mm -hmm. the mother talks about the father, you're still hurting the child because that child is a composite of both of you. Right. 23 chromosomes over here and 23 chromosomes over here. Right. So, you know, there's no such thing as getting a child to take sides. Right. And you often see immature, emotionally underdeveloped parents who will try to get their children to take sides with them against the other parent. Mm -hmm. You cannot do that. That is the most unfair and uh, 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 irresponsible and selfish thing you can do to try to get your son or daughter to take your side against their other biological parent. Right. Do you realize that if it wasn't for that other parent, that child would not be here right. in the first place and you're asking them to declare war against them and it's wrong. And I've seen parents do this to children as young as seven, eight, and nine. Mm -hmm. They're babies. You're asking babies to get involved in an emotional adult war. Right. It's wrong and it's unacceptable. Thanks. Well, yeah, that's very true. And you know, I have a lot of people in my life who will go through that situation mm -hmm. where they, mm -hmm. you know, the co-parenting situation isn't ideal because mm -hmm. it's oftentimes not a base of the children's best interests. And yes. so, like you said, the emotional immaturity gets in the way. Absolutely. And and the that. other thing I would add to that, we have to recognize that 
the demons of the family we grew up in mm. were passed down from the demons of the family our parents grew up in. Yeah. So when we talk about ancestry, we tend to talk about ancestry culturally, historically, spiritually, but we have to talk about ancestry psychologically. Mm. And not all that was handed down to us was positive and progressive. Right. The bad habits of great grandma may still be in the family system. The bad habits of great grandpa may still be in the family system. If great grandpa was an alcoholic, there's a strong chance great grandson would be alcoholic because it's very difficult to break the intergenerational curses of a family cycle. Right. Very difficult. You've seen this, I've seen this, where someone decides, my children are not gonna be raised like I was raised, mm -hmm. or my children are not gonna be surrounded around the types of threats to their survival as other children mm -hmm. were in mm -hmm. my family. So you often have to uproot your kids right. and take them somewhere else because you recognize how powerful the influence of dysfunction of the family system can be upon your children. And so I don't think we as African people has paid enough attention to eradicating the intergenerational transfer of psychological dysfunction. Right. It's a big issue. Child abuse is an intergenerational demon. When you look at child abuse, you'll find that generation after generation suffered from that child abuse. That's true. I never thought about it like that, but it's funny because my uh, one of the last things my grandfather was telling me is that you can have traits from somebody you never met. You know, it might be your four times great grandfather and they had this issue mm -hmm. and it exhibits itself, exhibits itself in you. Mm -hmm. So correcting that, being you pointing that out is, you know. And I'm gonna I'll, go one more level with that too, my brother. I would often argue, and of course I'm an African traditionalist, so I'm biased to the way we do things, right. you know, which is older mm -hmm. and, and, and predates Abraham, Moses, Jesus and Muhammad. Yeah, yeah. And in our tradition, we believe in ancestral veneration. We believe in keeping the ancestors uh, essence with us on a daily basis. We believe in pouring libation and we believe in honoring them and venerating them. This is another reason why, because even though your ancestors now on the other side, they're up in heaven in the land of the Arun, mm -hmm. they still influence things now. And because they're able to see their mistakes from a higher plane of consciousness, they're in a much better place to intervene and help fix what they broke. Mm -hmm. So that same grandparent who's responsible for the alcoholism, responsible for the molestation, mm -hmm. responsible for the uh, emotional abuse, the physical abuse, the abandonment, uh, the, the sibling rivalry, mm -hmm. now you can call on that same spirit and say, you introduce this into us. Can you help us fix it at the same time? Right. And this is why as African people, ancestral veneration is indisposable to the reconstruction of healthy black families and extended family networks. You need them ancestors. The same ones who harmed you can now heal you from the other side. Okay, so, and that, that is perfect how that segues in this next question. When you're talking about the African traditionalism and um, that information that you just gave, is that why the European value system dominates our household because we have lost our sense of African traditionalism and being educated about the African fundamentals and culture that we naturally supposed to possess. Absolutely. Cultural and ancestral genocide. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of our problem as African people is we have no cultural boundaries around us. Ooh. Every culture has a boundary. Uh -huh. They're insulated by their traditions and their customs, uh -huh. right? Uh, a European Jew will simply tell you, we don't do that. Right. A Mexican will simply tell you, we don't do that. Right. An Arab, an East Indian, uh, 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 an Anglo-Saxon, yeah. a, a, a Chinese will simply tell you, we don't do that. Right. With African people in America, we don't have a we don't do that standard mm -hmm. because a lot of us don't know who we are. And unfortunately, when they stripped out the culture, they replaced it with religion. And religion was no better than the slave plantation because just like the slave plantation, religion teaches you not to take control of your collective destiny to leave it up to God. Mm -hmm. That's no different than the plantation that tells you not to take no interest in your collective destiny, leave it up to the slave owner. So all they did was switch out a white slave owner for a white Jesus. And right. so now you're still not taking control over your life. You're saying it's up to God, it's right. up to Jesus. Black people's situation will get better when God decides to make it better. So that, save, that same slave conditioning that we got on the plantation, we actually get it inside of the black church today. Right. You see, and black church preaches a very dangerous colorblind consciousness 
that makes black people feel bad for practicing racial loyalty. Right. It makes black people feel bad for putting African people first. We're the only people in the world. You can't find another race who feels bad and ungodly for showing favor to their own kind. Mm. Black people are the only people who will go out of their way to prove to you that I'm not just loyal to black people. I don't just care about black people. Right. I care about everybody. Mm. You'll never hear that from another group. Right. And that's why the message of the most honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey, when he said, put the race first, right. we still haven't put the race first. We will die for religion. We will die for fraternity. We will die for sorority. We will die for Masonic Lodge. We will die for our gang. We will die for our neighborhood. We will die for our profession. We will not die for our race. We do not have a racial ego. We got a religious ego. Mm -hmm. Talk about my religion, I'll kill you. Talk about my gang, I'll kill you. Disrespect my church, I'll fight you. But disrespect African people, I'll forgive you before you even commit the offense. Yeah, yeah now you're right about that. And like I noticed too, this is kind of off topic, but like here in Atlanta, you know, it's a big LGBT scene here. And I noticed during Pride Month, all the black restaurants have a, a gay pride flag, mm -hmm. an LGBT flag mm -hmm. or whatever. But you look at the Mexicans, they don't have that. Nope. Chinese restaurants, they don't do it. Nope. Going back to what you were just talking about, how we don't do that. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But mm -hmm. we seek to like ingratiate ourselves with mm -hmm. every other culture and put it above and beyond our own. And so, because we have no <clears throat> cultural boundary. Mm -hmm. Whenever America catches a cold, we catch the flu. Right. Whatever America says is normal, we will take it and exaggerate it. Dang. It don't matter what white people do, no matter how dysfunctional and non-progressive it is for the black community to indulge in it, we're going to indulge in it. Mm -hmm. And that's a big reason why we got to watch what our children consume on television and radio, because we are literally the sponges that soak up all the filth of American culture and bring it right into our own community. Right. No, that's a fact. So um, switching gears, a few weeks ago, we saw Jamie Foxx kind of bend a knee to the Jewish community mm -hmm. where he apologized for an alleged anti-Semitic quote. Then in this same month, earlier, the NAACP held a convention um, and part of that convention um, was Meek Mill and Robert Kraft on a panel talking about stopping anti-racism and anti-Semitism. And that kind of confused me because I'm thinking, you know, the NAACP is supposed to be black. Why are they so concerned with anti-Semitism? I hadn't seen any anti-Semitic crimes committed by black people against uh, the Semite people. So, but I wanted to know, in your opinion, why does the European Jew have such an interest in the behavior of black people? Historically, the European Jewish community exploited the black community from a civil rights standpoint. Mm -hmm. We were used by them to be the out front foot soldiers of the civil rights struggle. Okay. They funded it, financed it, but they hid in the back. And then after we achieved those landmark uh, Supreme Court decisions and uh, legislative uh, policies, they then came out of the woodworks and benefited from it. So we have always been the front man mm -hmm. for the European Jewish civil rights agenda. The NAACP was founded by European Jews, right. and it is predominantly funded today mm -hmm. by European Jews. You understand? Right. And so... You know, that's one of the biggest reasons why it's difficult to have a conversation about racism against blacks without European Jews being included in that narrative. Mm -hmm. But also, even beyond the European Jews, we have to recognize that because America is so anti-black, this is an anti-black country. Right. There's no getting around it. Right. But because America is so fundamentally anti-black, in order to make sure black people never become the focus of true intervention, they have to include other people in the conversation so it can look like they're talking about us when they're really talking about helping another group. Okay. This is why they use words such as multicultural, right. disadvantaged, non-whites, mm -hmm. you know, uh, minorities, mm -hmm. you see, or the conversation that you referenced, which I did not see yet, but I heard some conversation about it. Mm -hmm. We're going to include the Jews with blacks. We're going to in include the gays with blacks, the transgenders with blacks, the Ukrainians with blacks, the Afghanis with blacks, never just black alone. Right. And the reason for that is to make sure we never become the focus of intervention like we was during the civil rights movement. Right. Dr. King was 
excuse me, a political and a media genius. Dr. King was able to keep the black agenda on the front page of the news and the television for nearly a decade. Mm -hmm. No other leader has done that since Marcus Garvey and Frederick Douglass. Right. Dr. King did that. And so after they were forced to give up that civil rights bill and forced to give up that Voting Rights Act and posthumously forced to give up that federal housing bill, they said, we gotta take the black issue off the table because right. if we don't get this off the media agenda, we're gonna keep on having to concede to Negroes right. and we don't wanna do that. So that's why a few years after Dr. King uh, was assassinated, the homosexual revolution took place because they oh. needed something to block out the black agenda. Okay. If you notice, every single presidential administration, there's a priority minority issue separate from what matters to black people. Mm -hmm. Every president had a priority minority issue. Mm -hmm. For Barack Obama, it was homosexuals. He used homosexuality to block out the black agenda. Right. For Donald Trump, it was illegal immigrants. He used the illegal immigrant war to block out the black agenda. For Joe Biden, it is immigrants and transgenders. Those are the topics he focused his civil rights issues right. on to make sure ours never see the light of day. Okay. You see, so you will never see black people focused upon as a singular entity like we were during the days of Dr. King. You'll never see that again unless black people organize and agree that we're going to push a race first agenda that does not include any other group. Mm -hmm. When we speak, we should only speak for the black. Right. And um, kind of moving into this, you see that a lot. We, we oftentimes talk about culture, black culture, and we recently just celebrated 50 years of hip hop. And we've pretty much claimed that. But when you step back, and I hadn't really seen an analysis on this outside of you, but when it comes to hip hop, which is black culture, well, I guess we could say it's black culture, it's owned and controlled exclusively by the European Jew. Absolutely. We make the music, we make the beats, but they fund it. All like the how profit. you were talking All about. All the profit is them. Right. Like you were talking about with um with the uh with the NAACP, you know, when they fund it, they essentially control it. So can we say that these art forms or expressions of art like hip hop, is it still black culture when we don't own and control it? Like the, you know, uh Lil Dirk or NBA Youngboy might make a song about doing horrendous things. And I'm not knocking them, but I'm just saying it's the European Jew and their platform and their right labels that put that out. They can't make a song about killing dogs. If, if today, if, uh, if Lil Baby makes a song about killing German shepherds, they're gonna stop that. Gonna, you can't do that. But you can talk about killing brothers all day long. You know what I'm saying? Yes. So is that really black culture when they own and control it? The art form is unquestionably African, mm -hmm. but the content is unquestionably European, mm -hmm. you understand? Mm -hmm. And the agenda is unquestionably one of genocide towards African people. Mm -hmm. At a fundamental level, taking us back to Garveyism, one of the central tenets of revolutionary pan-African nationalism and or Garveyism mm -hmm. is self-determination. Right. Black people have not made up our minds that we want to be a self-determined people. We are still content with handouts. We are still content with subsidy. We are still content with European paternalism. That means white men dictating our actions. Right. We're still content with European maternalism, white women dictating our actions. And until we decide that we really want to be free, because there's no such thing as freedom with another people funding you. Right. So the NAACP cannot be a revolutionary organization. Right. Right. The Urban League cannot be a revolutionary organization. Mm -hmm. Our fraternities and sororities can never be revolutionary organizations as long as you have a multicultural premise and a multicultural agenda. Our black churches cannot be revolutionary because in order to be revolutionary, you must be all black in purpose and mind, mm -hmm. and you must be all black in funding and subsidy. It has to be both. Right. And very few black organizations in this country, even conscious organizations, if you look at them close, they're not black in mind, they're not black in consciousness, not from an African perspective, and many of them are funded by European entities, mm -hmm. okay, or uh, entities that are hostile to African progress. We as black people have a problem 
doing it all by ourselves. Right. And we wonder why the Chinese are winning. They doing it all by themselves. Right. You see, the Arabs, they're doing it all by themselves. We're the only people running back to the government, asking them to fund things we need for ourselves while we waste $2 trillion, even when we have the reparations conversation. Mm -hmm. And I support reparations because it was Pan-Africanism that gave birth to it, mm -hmm. okay? But isn't it a contradiction to say we can't do nothing for ourselves until we get reparations for slavery, right. but we're a $2 trillion people, $30 billion on hair. Why do you need reparations to get started? Mm -hmm. You see that? $4 billion <laughs> on liquor. Why do you need reparations to get started? $2 billion on Air Jordans. Why do you need reparations to get started? 800 million on chicken, turkey, beef, and pork. Mm -hmm. Why do you need reparations to get started? Yes, we're entitled to reparations, but being entitled to reparations isn't the same as reparations being necessary for you to begin the process of reconstructing your reality. Right. At the end of the day, black America does not want responsibility mm -hmm. or accountability for solving our own problems. And everybody knows it, and this is why nobody fears us. Because as long as black freedom will require a black dollar, nobody's worried about black power. No, that's true. And um, you kind of touched on it. It's an element of white exploitation that we always make ourselves susceptible to. Uh, like with the hip hop thing, with the 50 years of hip hop. Like I said, I don't, you don't really hear too many people do a cultural analysis on it. Like right now in hip hop, we have a new sector with the podcast and two of the biggest podcast spaces within hip hop are run by white men, uh, DJ Vlad, Adam 22. And both of them have based their platform on black conflict and they exploit that. So I guess my question is, I'll give you an example. I wanted to bring this up, but like, on Vlad, I saw this a few a few years ago when uh, the late Kevin Samuels was still alive. Vlad was actually on there trying to instigate him to say something about you. He said, uh, you know, I had Dr. Umar on, whatever, whatever. And Kevin Samuels was intelligent enough to downplay it and instead turned it and kind of big up you and kind of, you know, talked about how you all had more in common than not. And you rarely see that. Most people go on these platforms and exaggerate the issues and um, amplify the issues between black people. So how do we, I, and this is beyond hip hop, how can we put ourselves in position to stop making ourselves susceptible to white exploitation? We have to make up our mind that what's best for black people is what's best for us. And right. we haven't done that yet. Most black people are selfish. Mm -hmm. We operate on a extreme pathological form of Eurocentrism. Mm -hmm. It's all about me, myself, and I. What matters to the group never weighs in on the decisions that we make about ourselves. Gangster rap could not exist in another culture because mm -hmm. they would not accept it. Right. But because the gangster rappers are some of the more uh, wealthy people in our community mm -hmm. and because black people love money more than everything, including Jesus, okay, even though they won't admit it, they love money more than right. Jesus, uh, whoever has the money will automatically be sanctified right. as a leader or somebody we can worship or right. follow. Mm -hmm. Money rules everything in the black community. We are not a people of morals and honor. If we were, there could be no such thing as gangster rap. If we were, there could be no such thing as uh, pastors, you know, making millions of dollars a year mm -hmm. with a church in a community that is, doesn't have a single relevant viable institution right. in it. You see, so we have to take a long hard look in the mirror because from a metaphysical standpoint, the world around you is a reflection of the world within you. And black people have to stop uh, uh, trying to scapegoat the white power structure all the time. Mm -hmm. They are responsible for our problems, make no mistake about it, mm -hmm. but they're not responsible for why we're still in them problems. Mm -hmm. We haven't made up our minds that we want to be free. The most honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey said it best when he said, if we really got to know ourselves and if we really made up our minds that we wanted to be free in 24 hours, Garvey said it takes a day. In 24 hours, we could have a new reality tomorrow. Right. We're not interested in freedom because we fear the responsibility that comes with it. So how do you change that then? Cause like I, going back to, uh, I believe uh, your kinsman Frederick Douglass said, well, you just said it, it's easy to build uh, strong children to repair broken men. How do we implement that in our children to make them want to accept the responsibility of doing for the race, putting Africanness first, you know in what I'm saying? In order to fix any systemic problem, mm -hmm. the solution 
has to be systemic. This is another issue we have as black people because you get a lot of hit and miss solutions, Mm -hmm. a lot of hit and miss programs. Somebody would say, well, I'm doing this, but you haven't systematized it. Right. It's not a solution. It's only a Band-Aid. Right. You understand? Right. So even with FDMG, we have two schools in Wilmington. Mm-hmm. It's not a solution. It's a solution for that area. Mm-hmm. But it's not a solution for the race until I systematize the schools and start putting them all over the world. Right. Until we franchise FDMG, the benefit is limited. Right. But again, going back to our selfishness, going back to our individualism, going back to our loyalty to our clique mm-hmm. rather than to the race, most of our what could have been solutions end up only being band-aids because we don't want to put the work in necessary to systematize it. I can't think of anything in the black community that's systematized outside of church. Who do you, who are five figures that black boys should know before they hit fourth grade? Before they hit fourth grade? That's tough because there's so many. Uh, I'm going to choose five, but I could have easily chosen 50 sets of five (laughs) because there's so many great men and women who've come through our past. Uh, One of them would be inventor Garrett Morgan. Mm -hmm. I think Garrett Morgan, his life story, what he went through, and also some of the landmark inventions that he gave birth to uh, are so critical that it's worth black boys knowing who they are. And I would say that our inventors have been a very neglected aspect Mm -hmm. of our history and culture. And one of the things we're gonna do at the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy is we're really gonna hone in on the inventors and pay attention to their achievements. So I'm gonna say Garrett Morgan, but I'm gonna speak collectively of all black inventors. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna put the queen mother warriors from the American African struggle. So I'm talking Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, Ida B. Wells, Mm -hmm. Fannie Lou Hamer, Anna Julia Cooper, the queen of the Pan-Africanist. Those five women, and of course we could go Anna Marie Douglas, Amy Jakes Garvey, there's others, uh, Mary McLeod Bethune, but I'm I'm particularly picking up the warriors, the ones who confronted the white power structure. Tubman, Truth, Wells, uh, Hamer Mm -hmm. in particular, they fought for the system excuse me, they fought against the system. Mm -hmm. Our boys and our girls need to know that they were black women who are willing to risk their lives as much as black men for our freedom. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when we talk about queen uh, mother uh, Harriet Tubman, she's the only woman in American history ever to lead soldiers into battle. And when we talk about queen mother Ida B. Wells, she was the closest woman in American African history who came to being the undisputed leader of black America. The only person who kept Ida B. Wells from being the undisputed leader of black America was Frederick Douglass. Had Frederick Douglass joined the ancestors 20 years sooner, and we're glad he didn't, Mm -hmm. Ida B. Wells would have went down in history as the first woman to be universally recognized as the leader of black people in America. That's how powerful she was, going from city to city, investigating lynches and exposing, think about that, Mm -hmm. exposing the names and addresses of the people responsible for the crime before we had any rights whatsoever to protect our lives. We got a kill. Absolutely. So those women. Third, I'm going to put Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey together. Mm -hmm. And and, and the reason for that, number one, in my opinion, they were the greatest American-African leader in the time they lived. Okay? They were also the greatest influences on black people globally. Mm -hmm. Of course, when you talk about Frederick Douglass, you're talking about the first black man to prove intellectually that black people were not inferior when he published his narrative of the life. And when you talk about the Honorable Marcus Garvey, you're talking about a man who arguably can be the only black man in modern history to be considered leader of the race. Yes, sir. Because there was a a, a chapter of the Garvey movement in every major black community on earth. So Garvey was a race leader, you see. I got to put Booker T. Washington in there mm-hmm. as both an educator and a Pan-Africanist, and he's the link between Douglas and Garvey. Mm-hmm. You know, people often ask me, how do you connect Douglas to Garvey? Real simple, Booker T. Mm-hmm. Because Douglas was Booker T.'s mentor and inspiration. Okay. So if it wasn't for Douglas, you don't get no Booker T. And if you don't get no Booker T., you don't get the mm-hmm. inspiration from Marcus Garvey. Right. Not only that, Robert Love was a Bahamian scholar and one of Marcus Garvey's first teachers. Okay. He ran into some political trouble in the Caribbean, and it was Frederick Douglass who got him out of it. If Douglass doesn't save Robert Love, he never becomes Garvey mentor. Garvey may never become the Garvey we know. So right. Marcus Garvey, excuse me, Frederick Douglass had an indirect hand in mm-hmm. giving birth to Marcus, Marcus Garvey. Garvey. Mm-hmm. See, that right there, I probably learned more about black history just then than I did no, I did then during my entire probably K through 12 education. 
And that's one of the common things that we see when it comes to school and black children is that our black educators not knocking them, but a lot of them feel like their hands are tied when it comes to teaching black children about black history and culture. And now we're in this time of where they banning critical race theory and you got DeSantis down there banning black history. What can black teachers do to circumvent that, to still impart black history into our children's curriculum? I'm gonna give you the solution and I'm gonna give you the band-aid. Okay. The solution is black teachers need to come together and build their own schools. Right. You follow me? That's mm -hmm. the solution. A solution is something that is done that eliminates the problem completely and forever. Right. You see that? Mm -hmm. That's the solution. But black people are allergic to building their own institutions because right. we don't want the responsibility. You right. see that? So the Band-Aid is for black teachers to create their own independent black teachers union. We've never had a black teachers union in America. Mm -hmm. And it's time to build one now. You see, okay. because now if you have a black teachers union, you can advocate for black children the way that they need because the white teachers unions, which are largely the American Federation of Teachers and the National Education Association, they don't advocate for black children. Mm -hmm. You understand, they only advocate for themselves. Right. So we need black teachers to form their own union to look out for themselves principally because they're the last hired and the first fired right. and the most overlooked and mistreated, you see. Even right now in America, we have a black teaching shortage for the first time in a long time, a black teacher shortage, mm -hmm. you see. So we need them to start their own union. That would be a good intervention until we are serious enough to implement the solution. Right, all right. So I wanna move into Garveyism right quick because I'm a Garveyite and the world knows that you're a Garveyite. Going back to my education, I didn't learn about Marcus Garvey in from kindergarten to 12th grade. Uh, I knew about Malcolm X because my mother was serious about making sure, because she was a single mother, she, was, she made sure that I knew a strong black man, but you know, she didn't know Marcus Garvey either. I didn't learn about Marcus Garvey until I was probably in college. And when I learned about him, I thought he was made up because I'd never heard of him before. And I'm thinking, somebody who did all of that, they surely would have taught us about that. But they didn't. Then as I learned, I'm like, wait a minute, this is wild. And so I wanted to know, when did you first learn about Marcus Garvey? I believe my introduction to Garvey was in my black history class at Mead Elementary, okay. fourth and fifth grade. I would be reintroduced to Garvey when I joined the UNIA, which was around 1997. I believe it was my final year of undergrad. Uh, and it's, ironically enough, the UNIA, which was considered international headquarters at that time in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. was right next door my entire life to the shoe store where my mother bought all my sneakers. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. Yeah. So from the fourth grade until my fifth year of undergrad, mm -hmm. so you're talking eight years old until 22, I was going next to the Garvey building mm -hmm. once a month, every six weeks, every mm -hmm. eight weeks no. for some shoes, right? I never knew. You know how I learned about it? They finally painted it red, black, and green and put a picture of Marcus Garvey in the window. Mm -hmm. Had they never painted that building, I would have never joined because I would have never knew right. that that was the Garvey headquarters. And so one day, I'm at the sneaker store and Elder Johnny Gossett comes around the corner. He was the caretaker of the building. He's mm -hmm. an ancestor now. Okay. And he said, can I help you? And I said, what's going on inside this building? He said, this is the UNIA ACL. He said, you need to come back Sunday at three o'clock. Mm -hmm. I came back Sunday at three o'clock, here we are. Right, so let me ask you this. As far as his philosophy and opinions and the African fundamentalism, it's a two part question. If you, can, if you can isolate one, what do you feel like is the most important concept that you hold near and dear to you and to parents, teachers, coaches, anyone who has a love for black children, which concept of Garveyism do you think we should introduce to black children first? Self-confidence. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, it's, it's, it's the belief in African triumph. Mm -hmm. It is the vision that we will ultimately succeed. Above all, Marcus Garvey was a revolutionary optimist mm -hmm. and you need revolutionary optimism, especially now because you can see uh, the discouragement in the faces of black people. Mm -hmm. You know, I think one of the reasons why I'm loved so much is I'm able to breathe some of that revolutionary optimism black into black people. Right. You know, they need, we need people 
who are going to cheerlead us. Right. As the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey said, you have to sell the black man to himself. Right. He said that the white man made being black a curse. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make it a blessing. Mm -hmm. We have to sell our people back to ourselves because we are we are punch drunk from racism. Right. But we are also punch drunk from insincere leaders who have come before us claiming to be leaders, never giving us a plan, running their mouth for decades mm -hmm. and never delivering nothing to the people. Right. So we're punch drunk on both sides. Mm -hmm. I'm punch drunk from my enemy and I'm punch drunk from my own opportunistic leaders who built me up and made me think we were going somewhere, 